Gloucester, Massachusetts is America's oldest seaport. For most of its 400 year history, Gloucester was the fishing capital of the world. Its lifeblood is dangerous and costly. More than 10,000 people have left this port and lost their lives in the Atlantic. When disaster strikes, few live to tell the tale. But one fisherman's story of survival at sea surpasses all others, and his ambition and daring made him a legend in Gloucester and one of the most celebrated seafarers in history. I'm Corey Kukuru for 1623 Studios, and this is the story of Howard Blackburn. The Blackburn Expedition was a failure. Howard was embarrassed that he couldn't control the mutinous Gloucester Mining Company. But without a company to keep, the prideful Blackburn dreamt of the impossible, a death-defying solo excursion across the Atlantic in a tiny boat. It had been done only five times before, by men with full use of their hands and feet, unencumbered by crippling arthritis. The first to succeed was Gloucester's own Alfred Centennial Johnson, a schooner fisherman who rode a 20-foot dory to Liverpool in 1876 to celebrate 100 years of American independence. It took 66 days and nearly killed him. Johnson considered his accomplishment a foolish stunt and rarely spoke of it. In April of 1899, Captain Joshua Slocum, a Nova Scotian who four years earlier became the first man to sail around the world single-handedly, spoke at the Chapel Street Baptist Church in East Gloucester about his 38-month odyssey. Blackburn most likely was there, and murmurs within the community began to crescendo that their famous sailor may return to sea. Howard admitted to having a vessel built, but nothing more. It was business as usual at Blackburn Tavern that spring. But before the back shore was in full bloom, Howard announced that he was sailing by himself to Gloucester, England in, oh, about three weeks. People were stunned. Blackburn divulged his plans. He sailed to the Grand Banks from dusk till noon each day, resting in the afternoons. From Grand Banks to the Irish Channel, he'd sail from dawn till dusk and sleep through the nights, weather permitting. He figured the Gloucester to Gloucester trip may take 50 days. Then, sailed to ports in France and the Mediterranean before taking a steamer home. The news traveled the world. Blackburn named his 30-foot sloop Great Western after the legendary British steamer, the largest passenger ship in the world and the first steamer built specifically to cross the Atlantic Ocean. The Acoriana Society, a Portuguese-American club to whom Howard was close, presented a giant American flag adorned with a vessel's name for the journey. Sloop boats were popular amongst independent fishermen. Less attractive, yet less expensive than schooners, sloops held only three or four bodies, but were made for durability. Crews were able to haul their catches faster and return to the markets while prices were high. The Great Western measured 38 feet from stem to stern, eight and a half feet wide and four feet deep. Howard stocked her with three months of provisions, from canned vegetables to cured meats. He had plenty of booze, tobacco, and a medicine chest filled with malted milk. The sloop sat at Lane's Wharf, behind Blackburn Tavern. Friends and admirers gathered. Some hardly budged until June 18, 1899, the date of departure. By then, 10,000 people packed the wharves for the best view. It was a gorgeous day with a familiar sea breeze. As church bells rang, Howard, cigar nestled in his thumb, walked from Main Street to the water. The crowd cheered and chanted, giving Blackburn room to wade through and climb aboard alongside a handful of pals. An old shipmate from the Graysell Fears, which sadly sank off the Newfoundland coast 18 months before, let go of the bowline. The Great Western trudged past Five Pound Island through hundreds of crafts. Roars, gun blasts, and horns echoed throughout Gloucester. Howard waved his captain's cap. It took two hours to parade from the dock to Eastern Point. The rooting flotilla returned to shore. The Eastern Point lighthouse clanged its fog bell and whistle. Howard let the last of his friends disembark at the East Gloucester Yacht Club, positioned the bow to the east, and disappeared off Cape Ann. Mm -hmm. 
With Thatcher Island's twin lights far behind him, Howard sailed into the night. Almost immediately, his limbs began to throb and swell. Rheumatism consumed him for eight straight days. He lost his appetite completely, subsisting on one bottle of malted milk. He couldn't fit boots over his stumpy feet. Feverish and unable to cruise, Howard drifted the Great Western off course to avoid passing vessels from noticing and reporting his condition. It got so bad that Howard detoured to Shelburne, Nova Scotia for a doctor, but couldn't reach shore through the fog. Returning to his charted course, Blackburn's symptoms finally subsided. He ate a week's worth of hot food and focused on regaining lost time. For the next month, Howard plodded through rain and pea soup fog toward the Grand Banks. Westerly winds of the North Atlantic were uncommonly quiet. Some days the Great Western barely made six miles. When the sun was hidden, Howard relied on dead reckoning. This was the busy path of the New England and maritime Canadian schooner fishing industries. Blackburn crept through the nights on the lookout for ships. Without fingers, he cleverly pulled lines with his teeth and adjusted sails with a twist of his waist. The Great Western was 500 miles east of Newfoundland when the winds began to howl. Howard had to take advantage. He twice worked nonstop for 34-hour stretches, eating only oatmeal with cold water if the seas were too bouncy for cooking. On its fastest day, the sloop gained 122 miles. Blackburn occasionally acknowledged a distant steamship, otherwise he reveled in the solitude. On August 16th, after two months at sea, Howard spotted the Scilly Islands, just miles from England's southwest coast. Truth be told, the excursion wasn't that difficult, despite Blackburn's initial sickness and uncooperative weather. In hindsight, Howard wished he took a more southerly trajectory. The warmer climate would have treated his body better. He felt a twinge of dissatisfaction. But all in all, mission accomplished. The next day, he entered the Bristol Channel which narrows to the Severn River and leads to Gloucester. A pilot boat met Great Western at Portishead and rode Howard to shore, where he telegraphed the yacht club to say he successfully landed in only 62 days. Delighted Englishmen surrounded the burly, sun-kissed Blackburn, who gave newspapermen a predictably colorful account of his journey as well as an explanation of his missing fingers. Great Western, flags flying high, was towed through the river canal towards Gloucester. People flocked to the marinas along the route to congratulate the lone voyager. Upon docking, officials paraded Howard through the city in an open carriage. The celebration lasted five days. He continued through the south of England, with Great Western in tow. Through the canals, Throngs of people rained flowers and cheers. Everyone wanted to pat his back or touch the triumphant sloop. Howard sold the Great Western, stayed in London for six weeks, and visited Paris for six more. In December, nearly four months after crossing the Atlantic single-handedly, Howard took a steamship to New York. A week later, the fingerless navigator, as the press called him, was in Gloucester. Ragged from the demands put on his body, but a hero once more. In the age of temperance, saloon keeping required lots of housekeeping. Blackburn spent a fair amount of time in court fighting fines and lawsuits or lobbying against forced closures of his highly prosperous tavern. He stayed in the good graces of elected officials and police officers. He maintained a sterling reputation by constantly serving Gloucester's poor families with donations of food and fuel. At the turn of the new century, Howard transformed Blackburn Tavern from wood to brick. Electric lights emblazoned his name above the front door. It was adorned with pictures and mementos depicting his life at sea. And the bar stools were always filled. The remodeled saloon wasn't the only thing under construction. Howard was still bothered by the illness and poor weather that elongated the trip to England. The Great Western, for all its attributes, felt cumbersome and struggled to self-steer when Howard needed sleep. It sapped the joy from the adventure. So he had a shorter, lighter sloop built at Smith Cove. 
Blackburn downplayed it, but the vessel was clearly designed for a new event. He christened it Great Republic, an homage to the largest wooden sailing ship ever built, a clipper that burned in New York in 1853, a day before its maiden voyage. Howard replaced the wording on his burgee from Western to Republic. Then on New Year's Day, 1901, he publicly challenged any man in the world to race him single-handedly from America to Portugal. If there were no takers, he'd go it alone from Gloucester to Lisbon. Blackburn exuded extreme confidence. He had already traversed the Gulf Stream 11 times before. The route to Lisbon carried 600 miles south of the route to England. The southerly passage would relieve his achy health and, weighing over 250 pounds, help shed a few malted milks too. Ground rules were set. Competitors must stake one to $500, which would be donated to Addison Gilbert Hospital. Vessels had to measure 30 feet or less and be manned solo. Newspapers flashed the challenge across the world. It was answered by a handful of hoaxers and publicity hounds. Three months passed without any serious suitors. Howard withdrew the challenge to focus on making the trip in record time, perhaps as few as 45 days. On June 9, 1901, in a scene nearly identical from when he left for England, Blackburn weaved the Great Republic through a mob of vessels and well wishers at Gloucester Harbor, aimed eastward, and sailed slowly towards the horizon. Howard anticipated homestretch inspiration by the beautiful Azores, a cluster of volcanic islands a thousand miles west of mainland Portugal. This excursion enjoyed a much better start. Blackburn kept the journal to document a bevy of passing vessels and marine phenomena at George's Bank. There were eye-widening encounters with swarms of swordfish and lazing sunfish, real threats to a small sloop. He swore at one point that he tried to lasso a baby sea serpent. There was an equally eerie experience when he quietly approached an anchored schooner in the dark of night. This gave Howard flashbacks to his nights hopelessly adrift with Tom Welsh. Then, a stroke of luck. The wind arose and a giant square rigger screamed past the Great Republic. Blackburn was able to ride its wake and the perfect gale for 37 hours. He said it was like stealing a ride on a freight train. Before he knew it, he was 600 miles out of Gloucester. When seas were rough, the spry sloop took its punches. The roiling water top soaked Howard to the bone, but at least it was warm green water. When winds died, a frustrated Howard had his spirits buoyed by encouraging shouts from the famous Confederate steamship Shenandoah. Blackburn stayed at it for weeks, fighting easterly breezes that wanted to push him back to Gloucester. On the 4th of July, he could see Corvo and Flores, the Azores' westernmost islands. Another week passed. There were days with hardly a ripple, then a 62-hour fight through a hellish nor'easter where Howard didn't sleep or eat and navigated by guesswork only. More than once, passing vessels tried convincing Blackburn to abandon ship. He resisted. When the storm left, Howard reached a fleet of fishermen off the shore of Cabo Espichel, merely 20 miles from Lisbon. Locals navigated Great Republic through the Tagus River. Blackburn docked in Lisbon just 39 days after leaving Gloucester beating his prediction by a week. It was the fastest non-stop single-handed passage across the Atlantic ever sailed. Blackburn was whisked to the American consulate and faded by dignitaries. Howard spent two weeks in Portugal before loading the Great Republic on a steamship bound for New York. On August 19, 1901, Blackburn stepped off the train at Gloucester Depot to a cheering crowd.